Hi, uh, so today we are going to talk about um, rationing unemployment and frictional unemployment. So what are, what are these things and why, do we, why are we interested in these concepts? So we've introduced a matching model of the labor market. We've studied various kinds of models for different production functions, for instance, linear decade, for different wage uh, functions, bargaining, for instance, or rigid wage or fixed wage. And this different version of the matching model uh, have um, very different properties and uh, we care about that and that's going to be important because these properties also imply very different uh, policy recommendations. So one version of the model or the other will have very different implications for what type of policy are good in bad times, when we're in recession, we want to fight unemployment, these different models will have uh, very different implications. So for instance today, unemployment is super high, above 10%. Um, if you look at one model or if you look at another model, you're going to make to have very different ideas for the type of policy that you can use to tackle unemployment. Uh, so historically, traditionally, uh, in the matching model, as we're going to see, there was only one type of unemployment, frictional unemployment. So what that means is that in these traditional models, if you were able to eliminate friction on the labor market, or if you were able to implement policies that reduce friction on the labor market, suddenly you know, your labor market would perform much better. You would be able to have drastic reductions in unemployment if you were able to do that. So because this model only featured frictional unemployment. So the type of policies that look very good in traditional matching models are policies that reduce frictions on the firm side, so policies that help firms find workers. So what are these policies? Well, for instance, you have placement agencies that have been uh, implemented all over European countries. So these are agencies that are run by the governments and that, head, uh, that help firms find workers for their uh, position. So for instance, in France, there is a national placement agency. If you're a firm and you're looking for a worker, it's compulsory to send your job advertisement to that national agency. And that agency is going to run through their database of unemployed workers and propose matches uh, that fit the description of the type of worker that you're looking for. They also, the placement agencies also have uh, meetings with unemployed workers to advise them, to help them you know, write their uh, CVs, to prepare them for interviews and also to point them in the direction of firms that may be looking for you know, the type of uh, experience and skill that the worker offers. So these types of, uh, and these types of policies are not unique to France. So Germany has a very similar system and just across the board in the, in the 90s and in the 2000s, a lot of European countries have implemented this type of placement agencies. And it's possible that the reason why these policies have been uh, popular is because the matching model, the traditional matching model, gained a lot of traction in the academic world. And, and then that the fact that the model was so popular, well-liked and widely used also spread to the policy world and that push for the type of uh, policies to be implemented. Okay, so that's one type of policy on the, on the firm side that help firm find workers. You also have policies on the worker side that are going to uh, be very popular and desirable in this type of model. So any policy that's going to force or push workers to search harder for jobs, these are also policies that are going to have a very strong effect uh, on employment. That's going to boost employment a lot, that's going to uh, reduce unemployment a lot. Just because in these models, the only issue is that you have this matching frictions between workers and firms. The matching is not perfect. So if you push workers to put much more input into their uh, matching, that's going to have a big impact uh, on reducing unemployment, boosting employment. So the type of policies that uh, would come out of that are, for instance, policies that monitor uh, workers' job search. 
And in fact, the placement agencies I just talked about uh, also do that. So they not only require firms to um, advertise their jobs uh, in their database, but they also make sure that workers who are unemployed search sufficiently. So for instance, in France, if you're unemployed, every two weeks you have a meeting with a counselor who makes sure that you've searched enough, you've called enough firm, you've sent enough uh, CVs. Okay. Uh, so, so these are policies that are going to be very effective in this model because if suddenly workers search much more, the matching friction will become much less of an issue and you'll be able to reduce unemployment. Uh, other policies that, that would do that, so you have monitoring, but police, for instance, if you decide to reduce unemployment insurance, cut funding to unemployed workers, that's going to make workers much more desperate to find a job, that's going to boost their search effort, and in fact, we have a lot of micro-evidence that when unemployment insurance becomes less generous, workers search uh, much harder. So, if you implement such a policy, search effort is going to go up and you expect unemployment to fall uh, drastically. And in fact, um, during the Great Recession, so in 2008, 2009, 2010, the generosity of unemployment insurance was increased a lot and a lot of uh, people who believed in the matching model in its traditional forms, they thought that that was the reason why unemployment was so high. Uh, and so they were uh, advising the government to reduce the generosity of unemployment insurance, to cut the duration of unemployment insurance, to reduce the level of unemployment insurance, to force workers to search harder in order to tackle uh, the unemployment rate. Because of course unemployment was quite high at the peak of the Great Recession, it reached uh, 10% and so people who believed in the traditional model they said that, look, that model describes the labor market well, we know that it's all about friction, if you can push workers to search harder, you're going to reduce unemployment drastically. And in fact, I'm attaching to the lecture an op-ed that was published in the Wall Street Journal by a Harvard macroeconomics professor that argued exactly that, that if only you cut unemployment insurance, you'll be able to uh, reduce unemployment drastically. That, and, and that argument makes perfect sense in the traditional version of the model. Uh, now, of course, there is an issue with that type of argument and this type of model, is that uh, these models don't capture at all the fact that it's possible that sometimes on the labor market the issue are not just matching friction, but that there are other, source, uh, other sources of unemployment, and in particular, one source of unemployment that doesn't feature in the traditional model, but that may be relevant is the fact that maybe there is just not enough jobs in the economy for all the workers. Maybe there is a lack of job in the economy uh, that will prevent firms to absorb all the workers, even if recruiting was uh, free for the firm, even if workers search very hard for jobs, Maybe there's just not enough job for everybody in the economy. So this is a very um, kind of old idea in macro. It's in a sense a very Keynesian idea. So Keynes had this idea that in bad times there are just not enough job for everybody. And he thought is that you know demand for goods and services was too low. Maybe wages were too high, and as a result, firms would never want to hire all the workers that were available. So that type of issues is lack of job, it's often called job rationing. So rationing meaning there's just not enough job for everybody. And this idea of job rationing, the idea that even, you know, irrespective of the uh, matching component firms who just not want to hire everybody because there's not enough demand for labor because maybe jo because jobs are, the wages are too high compared to uh, the productivity of workers. This idea is completely absent from the traditional matching model. So at a kind of scientific level, it's a bit of an issue uh, because it means the model is quite restrictive. You know, it doesn't allow for the full range of possibility. But also, so it's not so, but you know, it's not only a theoretical problem that this option is not considered in the model, that this possibility is not introduced. It's also uh, you know, a problem because it makes it makes the model not very. You know, the model does not provide a very good description 
of what happened at certain time on the labor market. Then that's a, a problem because you remember, according to Kuhn, the first important criterion for a model is that it has to be descriptive. It has to provide a good description of what we see in the real world. And it turns out that in bad times, something that you always see in the real world is that workers queue for jobs. Okay? Uh, and I'm going to show you evidence of that. It's, it's a very common sight in bad times that workers are going to line up to try to get jobs. And of course, when workers queue for jobs, when they line up, what that means is that for a firm, it's virtually costless to recruit workers. Workers are, well, there are these traditional pictures, you know, from the Great Depression where workers actually line up in front of factory gates. So if you're a factory manager, you can just pick any worker you want immediately. The workers are there in the morning waiting to get a job. Um, and so in that situation, it's virtually costless for firms to hire. So matching frictions are, are a non-issue because workers want jobs, want jobs so much that it has become free for workers to, for firms to recruit. Nevertheless, firms do not recruit. So firms are going to pick a couple of workers, but by and large, a lot of workers are going to remain unemployed. So we see situations where it's matching frictions are a non-issue. It's free, virtually free for firms to work with workers, and nevertheless, firms do not absorb all the workers in the labor force. So here you have a situation that's completely at odds with the traditional model. The traditional model says all unemployment is frictional. It says if there were no matching frictions, if frictions were not an issue, unemployment would disappear. And yet, you have this site of very long queues of workers who queue for jobs, workers who line up in front of factory gates, and unemployment remains. So you have these situations where, on the firm, for the, from the firm's perspective, it's free to recruit, and yet unemployment remains there. So it seems that something else happens in these situations when you see people queuing for jobs. Basically, what happens is that there is just a lack of jobs. That it's true that it's free to recruit, but firms just do not want to recruit. Although it's free, it's not profitable for them to hire more workers. So there is a lack of job in the economy that's very visible when workers queue. And so if we want to have a model that describes the labor market better, we have to allow for job rationing. We have to allow for the fact that sometimes firms just do not find it profitable to hire all the workers in the labor market, even if recruiting were free. And once we allow for that, so which we do to be able to describe queues of workers, the policy implications of the model are going to be quite different. Because if you realize that there is just a lack of job in the economy, then it makes no sense to force workers to search for jobs because they can search as hard as they want. Firms just do not want to hire them. It also doesn't make sense to try to, you know, push absolutely for improving the matching of the labor market because, you know, you have queues of workers. Matching is a total non-issue. And yet firms do not want to hire them. So these types of policies would look counterproductive in a world like this. And instead, what you would want to do is try to tackle the problem, which is that firms do not want to hire workers. So you want to push policies, uh, you want to implement policies that will push firms to hire more workers. So that could be maybe reduce the wage that workers are paid. That would be one, one route that you can take. Or other type of policy that would work would be to just hire workers directly. Uh, for instance, through public hiring, or try to push aggregate demand through fiscal or monetary policy to help workers or uh, to help firms sell more uh, goods and services. And if firms are able to sell more goods and services, they are going to want to hire more workers, which will reduce the issue of job ration. Okay? So it completely changes the, uh, the picture. So uh, in this lecture, what we're going to do for a start is um, to explain why all unemployment is frictional in standard models and why there is no job rationing. So basically, why if matching frictions as a non-problem, unemployment completely disappear in uh, standard models. Yeah. So we, I'll, I'll start by going through a little bit of a history of how matching models uh, have evolved, show you how like different problems have been uh, tackled uh, over time, and then I'm going to make the more formal argument that there is no job rationing in, in these models. We're going to use a little bit of math and our understanding of the model to show why all unemployment is frictional in these models.